a scion of many worlds. A few days had passed and things were going improbably well. The army was prepped and ready. Axiom had sped up their training in almost no time at all and they had started taking initiative, branching out in their own natural talents and pushing and pressing. The girls that had been minor thieves and pickpockets had transferred their talents into absolutely terrifying scouts. A woman who could use a ground-based radar or outright sense the condensation of the early morning to map out an area was scary. What had actually surprised him, although it shouldn't have, was the hardware they put together. A lot of these girls were going into demolitions or artillery when the Undaunted arrived. Because these bitches love cannons. There is a massive mobilization going on in the fort and they're preparing their ballistae. Ballistae. It turns out cannons are bleeding edge around here, so the 20 pounders that his girls have put together are not only bleeding edge, but scary bleeding edge. A three-dimensional image of the fort in floating water shows the wall, patrols, numerous buildings and storehouses. All told, it's a typical late medieval style building. Heavy stone walls to resist siege, crenellations for archers to hide behind, machicolations to drop things on anyone who tries to climb them. Yes, the stone is mostly uniform and there are other details that show that there are non-human skills being put into building this. The entire outer wall is shaped like a pentagon with the main entrance opposite of the point and the primary keep snug against the inside of that point. The obvious looking weak point appears to be a river that branches off somewhat through the keep and is used to both take away their waste near where it exits but also hydrates them near the beginning. Something that would be a main target in a siege. But this is not a siege. This is a lightning raid to be taken out just as the army begins to leave in order to head towards the Aridus Valley. The attack is coming. They're feeding and watering their pack beasts, getting supplies together, and having their local cobbler work overtime with extra soles for the boots. These women are getting ready to move fast and hard, which is exactly why Jasper had raced everyone into position, took a half day to rest everyone, and now we're behind a small hill to the northwest of the soon-to-be advancing column. Without the training and grit to move unreasonable speeds and the know-how to rebuild weapons where needed out of base resources, they would be having a far worse time. Couple that with their hunters going out to all but empty the nearby forest gave them all kinds of meat and rations. But they were on the ragged edge. If their blitz failed, then they would be cut off, dangling in the wind and with few places to run. But that desperate hunger also gave them exactly what they needed. Motivation. Today, there's victory or death. All right. Is everyone clear on the plan? Jasper asks as he looks over the mock-up of the area. Yay. Blast Squadron is going to be left behind with the bait cannons to rain hell from on top of the hill. You lure out the army by being a big distraction and squads Grapeshot and Fletchette go in through the sides. If we can get in great, if not, then we pound them with our cannons until they don't even want to go near the fort. Meanwhile, us girls with the bait give them hell. And then when they come after us, we sabotage the guns and run as if routed, circling around to do some knife work when the girls take control of the captured cannons and blow themselves up due to our tinkering. The fire-based captain of Blast Squadron notes before frowning, are you sure that they're going to tinker with them and not just ignore them? I can confirm that cannons are a known, but not widely used part of the Miru army. They'll know what they are and generally how to use them, the temptation to try will be immense. Even if they don't spring the trap, they will still try to keep control of and effectively pin themselves with the cannons, Lady Clarity remarks and Jasper nods. Excellent. So while a significant chunk is either dead or pinned with us cutting off their retreat, we have teams, hydro and dynamic making sure the fort is ours by entering through the waterway pressure cutting the bars and getting in to either reinforce grape shot and fletchette squadrons or to assist in the taking of the fort by attacking the defenders from behind and opening the main gate. 
And once we have the fort, we get our cannons on it and use their defenses back on them. Negotiate from a position of complete control, Jasper says. At that point, I go from mostly taunting and distracting to outright demanding their surrender. And myself, Lady Clarity and Magrika are all in reserve in case you start getting overwhelmed or they prove to have more champion-level opponents, Lady Aelur says, and Jasper nods. Once his soldiers started showing real skill and ability, they had come to him and demanded how. He had explained everything, including the philosophical bend he had gotten while in the mirror. It had taken some time for it to sink in, but they had all gotten it and were growing stronger. Reserve, yea right. We all have jobs to do, but if shit's going sideways, we drop everything and help you. Magrika notes, I am going to be reducing their Ulthara pack beasts into a red meat platter, and if they've got anything bigger with a bunch of legs, I'm going to rip them apart. My duties are to blind the archers and ballista masters upon the walls and prevent them from firing with any form of accuracy, Lady Clarity remarks, and I and my girls will be circling overhead and keeping everyone appraised of the situation at large, although these crystal radios are terrifying pieces of technology. Lady Aelor says a little nervously about the things that Horus had sent over as blueprints. The range on these things was hot garbage, but five kilometers of instant communication on a medieval battlefield? Game changer. As big of a game changer as the cannons, if not bigger. And they're jokes compared to the radio that's currently being guarded back at the monastery. That thing can communicate across distances that make this entire world appear to be a moat of dust in the ocean. Jasper remarks and Lady Aelur shudders a little. Brr, stop talking about that. I hate feeling so small, says the tall one. Magrika mocks and there's some friendly giggling. All right, so our plan is outlined. Are there any questions or concerns? Jasper asks the squad captains and lieutenants present. Why aren't we just sending our flying girls over and stomping on the resistance? The captain of the Fletchettes asks. Because that kind of stunt is so common that most forts are actually warded against it. Fort Earthgrasp is no exception. The open air above it is so solid that it only just lets light through. It's darker inside than outside. If we were to try and approach from above, we'd slam right into it and skid down to the top of the walls where the soldiers are ready and waiting for us. Lady Aelure explains. There's a bit of a wince in her explanation. There's some history in there, but that's for later. Which means that only the wall itself is actually vulnerable to attack. Thankfully, the weak points of the grills and the gate mean we can get in fairly easily. Jasper finishes and there's nodding. All right, that makes sense. It's something that bugged me most of my life, why most attacks didn't start with something like a ton of hell raining down from above. We should be able to overwhelm it once the undaunted arrive, but until then we have to play by the local rules, Jasper remarks, and there's a touch of mockery and sarcastic questions of how will we survive. He just rolls his eyes and grins. There are no true remaining questions and everyone heads out to their assigned positions. The show is soon to begin. Terry Kata is not a soft woman. She's harder than any example of her earthen element. Her hair is deliberately hacked short until it resembles a series of angled crystal spikes on the top of her head. Most believe she sleeps in her armor and others state that her armor is actually her skin because she's just that hard of a bitch. She lets them talk. It's the only mercy she gives to those who disrespect her. Speak all you want behind her back. If you speak it to her face, she will test your balance until there's nothing left but a shard perforated corpse. You do not advance from drafted militia to army champion in Miru without being the hardest of the hard. She had no favors to push her along, no family to whisper in someone's ears. She was no one's pet project and no one wanted a lowly earth aromenta in such a prestigious position. She got it anyways because her naysayers were nowhere near skilled enough to stop her. The orders this time were simple. 
some renegade shit for brains had decided to run off with a bunch of Miru criminals and offer them shelter. At Aridas Valley of all places. Go there and start breaking things until they fall out. Kill them. Fix shit so there's no stupid grudges then leave. Shake down, break them, make amends and take off. Easy. Unfortunately, her army was as slow as it was stupid. Sure, they were well-trained, but the little prima donnas were the pampered little idiots that knew how to march and sing in formation, but were raging hot garbage in actual combat. Unlike practice dummies, the enemy does not stay still and wait for your sword. They don't surrender after a few taps in the right part, and they do not give up when you have a killing blow on them. A proper fight has spitting and biting and dust thrown in the eye. A real fight gets you dirty and feeling like you've been dragged behind a carriage. None of these girls had been in that kind of fight. Thankfully, this was an easy mission that was mostly honor, so it didn't matter that they were well-trained idiots. The gates open wide and she begins to march out at the head of the army. There's a sort of vibrations on her gems that has her hackles up. Likely some idiot is considering taking a cheap shot at her to try and open up the position of champion. Idiot. There's a reason the armor is always on. They're not even a full kilometer out from the fort when a strange whistling noise pierces the air. She looks up and holds out her hand to stop the army behind her. Something is coming down. Something fast. A pair of mammoth moth wings break the sudden fall to reveal the thing as the biggest Urthani to ever live, clad in armor and with a pair of swords strapped to their hips. A starry patterned cape flutters behind them as they land and look down at her. She's unimpressed. I know you're heading for Aridas Valley, he says, and Terry snorts. So that coward iridescent wasn't lying? Some giant Urthani battle sorcerer is really the being offering shelter. I am. So Jasper Blue was it? Were you raised by an Earth Araminta? I know a few Jaspers, though the Blues I know are all water-touched. Actually, it was a joke to line up with my brother's name of Horus, Jasper admits with a grin. Hey, if she wants to burn time talking to him as his forces get behind her, that's fine. What's a brother and what's a Horus? Well, I think Horus used to be a clan name some couple thousand years ago. No idea what it means. As for brother, it's like sister, but for men. Men? Some kind of lesser woman without tits? Terry asks, sizing up the overlarge Urthani. The fool may not have tits, but there's a lot of chest, perfect target for a big opening attack, especially as she doesn't have to go through the tits to get at the heart and lungs. Not really. You know how in all forms of ancient history everyone agrees that something was lost when people came to Lacran? Yea, so? That was men, or the males as they're called. Basically, if someone like me quenches their loins in your own burning loins, then not only will we both find incredible relief, but there's a chance for a child to be born. Every now and then a child born in such a way is male as well and has the same ability. Make sense? No, but I don't really care. I'm losing interest. Are you here to fight, bargain, or surrender? Here to fight. Jasper answers and she nods, takes a single step up to him and slams a fist covered in slate and crystal into his chest so hard it shatters as it sends him skidding backwards. She quirks an eyebrow to see he'd only skid back about 10 meters. The trenches his foot claws dug into the ground probably have a lot to do with that. The other eyebrow goes up as his armor undents itself and is quickly immaculate once again. He gives her a smile. I think I like you. She just takes a strong stance and is sent skidding back a few meters when he charges and punches her with the force of an avalanche. She steps out of the groove, her gripping into the ground, dug and brushes herself off. So I'm getting an actual fight. That's nice, she notes before launching herself at him with a wordless war cry. 